the purpose of the microbiota vault is really to preserve the biodiversity. And this is an invisible biodiversity because bacteria are so small we cannot see them. And we realize now with all these uh, new technologies we have what they are there for. And this is really the attempt to store this for future generations because if they get extinct, they will be gone forever. It's a vault that contains samples of the microbiota that inhabits our gut. It's precious because we are only just starting to understand the importance of the invisible microbial world that lives in and around us. The microbe or microorganism is the name given to all microscopic life. And emerging research is teaching us how this invisible biodiversity shapes our lives more than we could ever have imagined. Even in our own bodies, 50% of cells are non-human, making up an internal microscopic ecosystem known as the human microbiome. These communities are constantly evolving alongside our increasingly urbanised lifestyles. This has been worrying scientists like Professor Maria Gloria Domingos Bello, a microbiologist who's dedicated her life's work to understanding the effects of this change. So Gloria, you're on a mission to save our gut microbiota. Just how badly has it been depleted? So urbanization is driving the microbiota of humans to be much poorer. We are losing diversity. What we know is that with urbanization, chronic diseases that are related to inflammation and metabolism are increasing, are rocketing, and microbial diversity in our guts is decreasing. Uh, the drivers of these extinctions are our modern life and our processed food, antibiotics, many antimicrobial practices that we have in urban life. Urbanized people are losing diversity and urbanized people are having more asthma and having more type one diabetes and having more obesity. When did you have this idea to create a microbiota vault to store samples? So we have been seeing the disappearance since 2012, the first studies, and then our studies and many others show this correlation, particularly hotspots of biodiversity. This is developing countries, traditional societies are still producing their food in natural ways. So we need to tell them, you know, you guys, are healthier you have a healthier lifestyle than we do but on the other hand we have medicine that you don't have so as you move towards a more technological society what we need to do is understand your health before you become like us but if we don't save currently the microbial diversity that exists we won't have it to restore and the microbiota vault has that purpose Gloria was inspired by Norway's Arctic Seed Bank, aka the Doomsday Vault, safeguarding the seeds of the world's most vital and diverse crops. So she started the Microbiota Vault, a not-for-profit initiative linking a network of scientists to create a global system of research. So how many different countries have you been collecting from? So we have been collecting in Ethiopia, in Laos, in Ghana and also in Switzerland. Professor Pascal Varnash is one of the scientists working on the Vault pilot. Recently, she travelled from her base at the University of Lausanne to Laos to gather samples, working alongside health workers from the Laos Tropical and Public Health Institute. Here we see uh, one of the technicians that is just aliquoting the, the faecal sample, so we always have this flame in the field to try and make it as sterile as possible. We then collect the faeces, they install a field lab. Why are you collecting faecal samples? from villages in Laos? So it's well known that basically like people that have a more traditional lifestyle, especially like a traditional lifestyle where they have a very variety of foods that they eat, that they have a more diverse microbiome than we do. So they have also been less exposed to antibiotics. There have been more basically uh, interactions with the environment, with animals, with uh, basically like other kind of microbes that they get in contact with. And all of that contributes to the fact that they have a much more diverse microbiome. And it's known that basically like the microbiome as we have it in the westernized world has been basically losing some of the microbiota that is also probably contributing to the fact that we have more non-communicable diseases. Sites such as this village in Laos are part of ongoing research projects. 
How do the villagers respond to this? I mean, there's the, you've got a lab in the village and then you want their faecal matter. I mean, there's a lot of basically preparation beforehand, so we don't just pop up and say, hey, can we have your poop, please? Yeah. So it's a bit more complicated than that. And basically, like, the team really first, like, work with the village elders and then basically with the village health volunteers, they go, they explain why do we do that, why it's important, what can they expect from it. We also want to make sure that uh, basically the time between when the fecal sample was emitted and when it's really frozen, that this is as short as possible. So in other places we normally do that with, with dry ice. So this is a basically frozen CO2 that you can then use to basically really cool down the samples very fast. This doesn't exist in Laos, so what we have is that we have like uh, portable freezers. Working out how to gather and transport these samples is just one of the many problems to be solved. There's a lot of legal hurdles associated, obviously, because, I mean, it's a human-associated material. How do you deal with all the personal data and how do you integrate them in the vault? But the focus for Pascal and her team is how to preserve the bacteria in the samples. What we've got in here is all the samples that we collected in Laos. And we have the different uh, stool samples, the saliva, breast milk and all the different microbiomes that we collected. Hello everyone. Yeah, so here we actually have Aline. Hi Aline. <laughs> that is working on viruses um, that infect bacteria. Yeah. So she is uh, looking at these bacteriophages and also growing them on, on plates and in tubes. Here is Simon that works with me together on the Ethiopian project. And then here we have the, the two incubators, so the bacteria, they like to, to, to have it warm. So in our body it's 37 degrees, so you see here that like this um, two basically like cupboards are also at 37 degrees, so they have the good conditions. But the gut actually is more anaerobic, so that's why, why we also have these devices. So you see there Eugen, one of the collaborators from the microbiota world, also working. But hard to wave when you got your hands stuck in the tent. <laughs> we cannot allow the introduction of oxygen into it because that tends to kill all the oxygen sensitive bacteria. So this takes out the oxygen and then we will put in nitrogen gas and that will try to purge as much oxygen out as possible. As well as collecting samples from less industrialised countries, Pascal's team are also collecting from Swiss donors. This is to generate a complete picture of the global microbiome. So tell me a little bit about these preservation techniques. I mean, why are they needed? Yes, because uh, the goal of the microbiota vault is to have a long-term preservation of the microbiota samples. And this is because bacteria samples, even when frozen at minus 80 degrees, they tend to degrade over time. And also, they might be damaged by the ice crystals that are formed during freezing, and that usually tends to kill the bacteria. And what we're doing is we are looking at different cryoprotectants that protects the bacteria from damage during freezing. And we are also looking at different uh, reducing agents. So what is a reducing agent? Reducing agent basically is responsible for maintaining the oxygenless condition of the samples, which much more simulates our gut. And what we have in here is a glycerol, which is a, a cryoprotectant to protect the cells from freezing. And we also have these, as you can see, these black beads here. These are palladium beads. Mm -hmm. These are the reducing agent that I mentioned earlier. And these help to maintain the anaerobic condition in the tube. And then we would freeze them for a year. And then we would validate after a year to see how it compares to the fresh sample. But you don't want this to be preserved for just a year. I mean, you need it to be, what, five years, 10 years? Yes, exactly. Ideally, we would like it to last a lifetime or more so that the future generations can even benefit from this. Researching preservation techniques for samples stored in the microbiota vault is a priority for Professor Pascal Von Asch and her team. But they're also interested in maternal microbiota, studying mothers alongside their newborn child, so that they can monitor the ongoing development and health in relation to these results. So basically your microbiota has a if it's healthy, it has a positive effect on your immunity. Yeah, indeed. So basically the immune system matures at the same time as also does the microbiota. So we acquire the microbiota at birth and then there's different stages that the healthy microbiota matures through until it's stable. And during this time, actually, there's different bacteria that then interact with the host and really have an effect on the immune system. So they lead to the induction of given cells and basically primes them. And we also know that if you have disturbances in early life, as an example, if you take antibiotics uh, as a child or have to take antibiotics repeatedly, this can disturb the microbiota and then lead to lifelong basically health issues as your immune system hasn't been primed in the right way. 
So this is why you want to study um, mothers in places like Laos and, and also the children as well? Also. Yeah, exactly. So we call the window actually from pregnancy to the second birthday the first thousand days. So what we know is basically that the microbiota really develops in this time. And what you also know is that basically like during this time it has a big effect on lifelong health. So this is called the developmental origin of health and disease theory. And what you're really interested in is to understand if basically this microbiota seeding in the infant and also like the development is having an impact on metabolic health. Microbial seeding is the process of acquainting newborns with microbes swabbed from their mother. This is particularly significant after C-section births as the child has not had the natural microbial rich introduction to the world. Is there a sense of urgency to what you're doing? Kind of, <laughs> yeah, like the soonest we can try and preserve this diversity which is so important for our health and the planet health, the better it is. Pascal's team are part of a small group of scientists currently trialling and developing the best methods so that these practices can then be rolled out. So Pascal, I guess you're not just sort of working on, on preservation techniques, I mean you're sort of trying to work out and develop protocols because it's not just about you and your team, you want the whole world involved in this. Yeah, indeed, it's quite a, a big responsibility if you want, because the idea is really that we try as a launch team basically to set the bases so that we can then really collect visas from around the world. And afterwards, we really want to have like uh, protocols that can be used in different settings. It's also of no use if this uh, protocols just work in a lab, like in the westernized world. So it's really protocols that have to work in the field labs that we have seen so that everyone can preserve the samples in the best way in any spot of this world. So you won't have to go out to all these different countries. You'll be able to just ring them up and say, hey guys, can you, can you get this for us? You know. I think even better, they will ring us up and we'll say, hey, we have really cool microbiome here. Can we preserve it in the microbiota world? I think that's the ultimate goal that we hope for. While this project is still only in its pilot stage, these first important pieces of the puzzle all need to be stored somewhere. We head across the country to the University of Zurich to visit Professor Adrian Egli, the director of the Institute of Medical Microbiology, where they're working to unlock the microbiome code. Here we process all the samples. We um, try to identify uh, bacteria in the samples. We try to do resistance testing, so figure out antibiotic drug resistance. And over here we have automated processing machine. In another room are large freezers storing samples sent by Pascal's team. So at the moment you are the microbiota vault. We are in our pilot phase, this is where we have the sample, so as you can see this is a very well equipped room with lots of minus 80 freezers. It seems not only scientists are interested in the microbiome, with artists like Martin Ergeli bringing a vivid colour palette to these naturally monotone images. Please tell me this is not what my gut looks like. But this is what your gut looks oh, like. <laughs> so not that colourful, is, surely. This is an electron microscopic image of a stool sample uh, from a travel returner. So here, this is a typical rod-shaped bacteria that's most likely an Escherichia coli. Um, here, this could be a Fusobacterium. This one here uh, is likely an Enterococci. The microbiome uh, is also not only consisting of bacterial cells, there are also viruses and fungi in our gut. In just one gram of stool, bacteria, viruses, fungi and other microbes can be found in their trillions. And yes, that green giant in the middle is a bacterium. So you want to get the DNA out of these bacteria. I mean, how will that help with what the vault is trying to achieve? So what we try to understand is um, how diverse are um, samples which we receive. Um, and we try to better understand that. And the first step to do this is to crack open these bacterial cells. So we have different tricks how we can open them and release basically the genetic information in them. And by analyzing this genetic information, we can say what they are. The team here are now working on samples collected by Pascal and Laos. So what we have here is a gut sample which was uh, frozen mm -hmm. and uh, we will further analyse this now in the lab. Lab manager Diana Albertos-Torres is in charge of the next steps. 
So what are you about to do here? So this is the some bacteria that we've grown after plating the stool. The idea is to extract the DNA of all of this that has grown here and then sequence it to really uh, know what is the composition of. So you're going to um, crack all of those bacteria cells and get the DNA out of all of them? Yes, a bit of everything that has grown and then this would go to DNA extraction. DNA sequencing is a set of techniques for determining the order of the nucleotide bases in a molecule of DNA. Our ability to decode this genetic information and understand its variations is paving the way for revolutionary advancements in numerous areas of science. We also put it into this tube here that has very small uh, bits that then um, this goes to a special machine that shakes it very fast so the cell cracks open and the DNA is floating around. Okay. And then the machine will move the sample from here to here to here. That will help to clean the sample and just get the DNA and remove all the rest of the Okay, so it's like a little mini washing machine. Exactly. <laughs> More or less. <laughs> we first of all crack open the bacterial cells and we get the DNA out of it. And then we look into one particular gene which is called 16S. It's like the, the cover of the book. It tells you what kind of bacteria is in there. So what is in the sample? Um, how diverse is the sample? And as the final step, we would actually go and link this to health versus disease. And what we try to figure out is which bacteria are pathogenic and which ones are helpful for our well-being. The first human genome was sequenced in 2003 using what is now referred to as first-generation sequencing. Although highly accurate, this was a slow and labour-intensive process. Now next-generation sequencing can process millions simultaneously. So I've already loaded the DNA here and it's prepared for sequencing. Perfect. So this is a, a next-generation sequencer and what this allows us to do is not only to sequence one bacterium, but all the bacteria in our sample at the same time. And um, on this so-called flow cell here, we can sequence 400 million molecules at the same time and we'll come back in 39 hours um, to look at the data. What now takes hours could have taken weeks, months or even years on previous sequencing technologies. Whose job is it to look at 400 million DNA? <laughs> the people who analyze the data are called bioinformaticians. And uh, they develop programs and databases to actually then analyze all these little fragments and try to see which uh, fragment belongs to which species and then sum that up so we get a summary of what different bacteria we can find in the uh, given sample that we have. Across the university campus, Dr. Anton Leverenko is one of the bioinformaticians studying the links between gut microbes and the environment. So we know what's happening to the samples, they're going in the, in the freezer, in the vault, but what's happening to the data? Because you and a number of others are, are crunching these numbers, aren't you? Exactly. The sequences themselves have, are very limited in use because we need to have this contextual information, also called metadata, that describes the environment that the sample originates from and the lifestyle of the individual that contributed to that sample. Anton's job is to standardise the strategies of data processing so they can compare different microbiomes. Collecting contextual information is critical and making it right is important. And by making it right, what I mean is to collect information in a standard way. So we want to understand how the lifestyle, how, how daily practices of the, of the people who deposit their samples to the microbiome vault kind of influence and shape the communities in their gut. All right, so I live in the UK uh, and I know my diet could be better. So um, tell, break it to me gently. How bad is the gut? microbiota in the UK? The truth is it's not as simple, right? So the truth is that we're really at the early stages of understanding how healthy microbiome look like. So what we know so far is how microbiomes from people living traditional lifestyle, microbiome people living in industrial populations look like and how they differ among each other. And let me show you something. So we can say that any given group of individuals can fall somewhere uh, along this gradient of industrialization and the further apart they are the more distinct the more dissimilar the microbiomes are so we can see that there's a very clear kind of a gradient of industrialization uh, which is reflected in the human microbiome. I guess what this graph shows is and it's important to remember that 
you know, not everybody who lives in an industrial country has an, an unhealthy microbiota, and, and, and same with people in traditional countries as well. Yeah, this is one way to put it. So maybe um, a, a word of caution here is that we don't actually know pretty well of how the healthy microbiome look like, but by ramping up our effort to characterize the as diverse microbiomes around the world and a kind of a more global microbiome service, we have this opportunity in this very young field to build a robust system right away and then build on top of it block by block and then later on we'll be able to generalize and to synthesize on all this huge volume of information and data in the public domain to actually understand the biology behind the microbiome and the variant and the variation and how that relates and how that shapes human health. While this research is on the leading edge of science and could fundamentally change our approach to healthcare and lifestyle, scientists are still only scratching the surface. This is a research field which is only possible since about 15, 20 years due to the technological limitations we had. So it was not possible to actually describe this biodiversity um, a couple of decades ago. Do you really know which bacteria are linked to certain diseases? For a few, you know, selected diseases, we have a pretty good idea. But we are really starting this uh, journey, I would say, and there's a lot to figure out during the next couple of years. Eventually, we will be able to link certain types of bacteria to diseases, and then you know, we could try to modulate the microbiome in a certain way, and that would allow us to personalize, for example, treatments. And when you talk about treatments, are you talking about such things as, as fecal transplants or other treatments to remove the bad gut biome and put in a healthier gut biome? So there are different types of potential treatments you can use to modify the, the, the microbiome and the microbial diversity. Um, one is clearly fecal transplantation, but that's a very harsh way to do it because you, you add a lot of diversity where you do not necessarily understand what you're actually doing. So this is very untargeted. Um, you could also modify the um, microbiome by applying antibiotics. So thereby you will reduce certain types of bacteria, but there you always have the risk that antibiotic drug resistance may emerge. There are nowadays more sophisticated ways, so you can use bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are viruses which can only infect bacteria and they are so specific to certain species, even to certain strains of bacteria, that you can eliminate certain types of bacteria. And I think in the future we will most likely uh, use phages or phage cocktails, which will allow us to modify the gut microbiome. We've heard antibiotics mentioned often during our journey, as part of the solution, but also part of the problem. What about antibiotics? I mean, we know that they can actually damage the gut microbes, so where does that leave us? So antibiotics are a blessing for mankind. Due to antibiotic therapies, we are able to really have the achievements of modern medicine, like cancer therapy, transplantation, surgical interventions. Um, so antibiotics are important and they can be life-saving, but we need to be careful where we use antibiotics. And this is absolutely important to understand. Yes, we use maybe too much antibiotics, but not just in treating human patients, also in the environment when we talk about, for example, food production and so on. You mentioned before that you see this uh, microbiota vault as an opportunity. I mean, do you really sort of, do you think of it as, as you're part of something bigger here that could be really great for humanity? Yes, absolutely. So this is one kind of a romantic way to put it. We are building something to last, something to preserve the legacy. The microbiome is something that evolved with our species for thousands of years, and now it's disappearing. If not now, then when? It's really important to be aware that we're basically like a whole world with differences that are actually important to catch. And I think also for such a vault, it's really important to get everyone on board because everyone's microbiome might be important for future generations. So I think that's really crucial. Could this change how we treat different diseases? I think it will completely change how we prevent these diseases. We have to 
learn how to be technological societies respecting nature. For Gloria, the vault is about saving our microbiota so that in the future, scientific advances will help microbiologists restore our gut microbiome to improve and support global health. Can we provide a service so that the world can see the composition of those samples, trying to create the real probiotics that the world needs? Thank you.